Good evening, St. Rest family and friends. How blessed of God we are to be in Bible study uh, tonight. Uh, for tonight and for the rest of the month of December, we will have year-end reflections where we look back at several sermons that really spoke to our church, really gave us a sense of help and hope with where we are in the life of our church. Uh, so for the next few weeks, you'll see uh, various sermons from myself and other uh, pastors who have shared with us this year. And as we reflect on how good God has been to us this year, we'll look back at some of those year and reflections and those sermons that really blessed our church in its entirety. Tonight, I want us to look at a sermon I recently preached this past Sunday. Christmas time is here as we're in this Advent season. It's incumbent upon us to recognize that while we are excited about that babe born in Bethlehem, the plan of salvation was birthed in a garden, that God had intentional design for the intentional deliverance of man. God had an intelligent design to intentionally deliver us from sin. So let's go to this sermon. Christmas time is here. Take it from Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. Genesis chapter 3. Verse number 15. If you're in Galatians, you're in the wrong testament. <laughs> the book of origins, Genesis chapter 3. Verse number 15. If you have it, please respond by saying amen. amen. There the Bible reads, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That's enough. This is God's word. You may be seated. The time this I have to share, I want to tag this text. Christmas time is here. Christmas time is here. What signals Christmas for you? What sign do you need to know that Christmas is here? For some of us, it's the lighting of trees and holiday lights that are around the house, decorated outside of the house. Or maybe a Christmas tree that hangs in homes or in businesses or across malls in places where you can see them. For some, it may be the shuffled playlist of famed Christmas carols and classic Christmas songs. It may be hearing Donnie Hathaway's This Christmas. Or if you're not that sedity or you're a little bit more dignified, silent night or away in a manger. Or if you're in another section of town, it might be hearing James Brown sing Santa Claus. Yeah. Yeah. Go straight to. I apparently see that some of y'all had a little bit more on your playlist <laughs> than James Brown and Shirley Caesar. <laughs> for some of you, it may be putting out Christmas cookies and milk for your respective Santa, maybe oh. wrapping presents under the tree. But for some believers, it's the nativity scene at Bethlehem, uh -huh. it's the view of Mary and Joseph's baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger because there was no room in the inn. It's the scene of shepherds in the fields keeping watch over their flock and watching the angels appear singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Or maybe the wise men coming from afar, seeing the star in the east and coming to worship him, bringing him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We consider that to be Christmas time. Yeah. When we view that nativity scene in Bethlehem where God eternal stepped out of eternity into time to become God incarnate and that babe in Bethlehem was born as the savior of the world. Yeah. But if you think God's plan of salvation began at Bethlehem, you shortchange God's intelligence and you undermine God's brilliant plan of redemption. Because while the Savior was born in a manger, the plan of salvation was born in a garden. 
So we we'll look at Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. Scholars contend that this is the proto-evangelium. This is the first announcement of the gospel. That after Adam and Eve fell into sin, when they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, after God condemned the conniving servant and condemned them for their commitment to sin, we have here God's plan of salvation wrapped in one verse. I will put enmity between you and the woman between her offspring and your offspring. Yeah. He will bruise your head. Yeah. And you shall bruise his heel. It's in this verse where we have a foretaste of glory divine. Yeah. Where we see God's plan of salvation put into words for God to redeem mankind from his yeah. sin. Yeah. In this one verse, yes. we see both the incarnation of Christ and the atoning sacrifice of Christ. It's in this verse where God unveils his ultimate plan of salvation for all of humanity. And when we come to Christmas time, we need to view Advent season through the lens of God's plan for salvation. Yeah. Because Advent sheds light on God's intelligent design for intentional deliverance of mankind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Church, Christmas time is here. Uh -huh. It is not in the gifts under the tree. Yeah. Uh -huh. It is not in the nativity scene in Bethlehem. When you come to Christmas time, it ought to remind <laughs> you that when you commit sin, God already had a plan in place to snatch your soul from the snares of sin and redeem you back to himself. And as we look at this Advent season in one verse, as we pick apart this text, it shows us what we should view at Christmas time. First of all, Christmas time affords us a view of gruesome sin. Christmas time allows us a view of gruesome sin. No, in the first phrase of this verse, the Bible says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and your offspring. This word enmity better translates to the word hatred or hostility. The message Bible renders it, I'm declaring war between you and the woman. That fittingly describes Satan's relationship to humanity. We are at war against each other. You ought to be careful to think that Satan is your friend because he's always in your ear. Satan is an enemy towards humanity and its efforts to draw close to God. Satan does not care for your well-being. Satan has no regard for how well you do. Your relationship to Satan is not on a dating ground. It's on a battlefield. Satan is at war with you. When you see the tactics he used, one of the greatest tactics Satan has in his arsenal in this battlefield is deception. <laughs> Satan cannot cause you to sin, but Satan can deceive you to think that sin is good. But when you look at this text, it affords us to know that sin is not good. Sin is gruesome. Uh -huh. Now, why would you say sin is gruesome, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. First of all, sin is gruesome because it is a battle of the will. Don't close your Bible because it's right there in the text. As you look at the beginning of Genesis chapter 3, Satan gets in the ear of Eve and tries to undermine God's plan for them in the Garden of Eden. God had already told them, you can eat whatever you want in the Garden, except 
for the fruit that comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and yeah. evil. And yeah. after he talks her up to see how good the fruit looks, the Bible says that Eve took the fruit of her own free will. She ate the fruit, gave it to her husband, and her husband, on his own free will, ate the fruit as well. Now, you have to look at the text for what it says. All right. The text does not say that Satan forced the fruit down Eve's throat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The text does not say that Satan threatened Eve with death if she didn't eat the fruit. Right. The text does not even say that Satan forced Eve to eat the fruit or that Eve yeah. forced Adam to eat the fruit. Yeah, yeah. The text says of their own free will, yeah. they ate the fruit. Yeah. And when they ate the fruit of their own free will, they were naked and ashamed. Yeah. 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 And if you read the creation story, you'll discover that was not God's will for their life. God's will was for them to dwell in the garden and be in his presence free from both the conscience and the constraints of sin. God created Adam to tend to the garden and watch over his creation. God created Eve to be a helpmeet to Adam as they worked together to watch over the garden. But Satan got in their ear and made them think that their own free will was better than God's will. Yeah. And church, that's why sin is gruesome. Sin creates the illusion that your free will is better than God's will. Yeah. Preach, pastor. I'm trying the best I can. Yeah. Yeah. Sin creates the illusion that your free will is better than God's will. Sin will make you think that whatever you choose outside of God is better than what God chose for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you choose to let that one drink become a hangover the next day, yeah. you'll discover that what you chose was not better than what God had for you. Yeah, yeah. When you choose to lie on something or someone, you'll discover that the lie you told was not better than the truth God chose for you. When you cheat and deceive to get your own way, you'll discover your cheating and your deception was not better than what God had already planned for you. That's why you need to be careful with sin because it's a battle of the wills. Sin is so gruesome that it will make you think your free will is better than the will of God. But not only that, it's not only a battle of the wheels, it's also a battle against the word. All right. I'm still in Bible country because when you read the beginning of Genesis chapter 3, the first thing Satan says in verse number 2, did God really say that you're not supposed to eat of this fruit off this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Did God really say that? Hey, God don't know what he's talking about because you won't die, you'll become deity. Because he knows in the day that you will eat it, you'll become like him knowing both good and evil. Now mind you, God had already given him his word to both Adam and Eve. He already told them by his word what they should and should not do in the garden of Eve. You have all the fruit and vegetation you want, but don't eat from this tree. God had already given them his word. And yet by the deception of the devil, they decided by eating the fruit that God's word was not enough to sustain their life. Look at what happens with the word of God. The world was created by his word. Their lives were established by his word. God has set up their livelihood by his word. Yet they decided in their sin that God's word was not enough to sustain their life. And church, that's why sin is gruesome. Sin is not gruesome because of the feelings you have in the moment. Sin is not gruesome because of the actions you perform. Sin is gruesome because you decide God's word is not enough to sustain your life when you choose to sin. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. God told you that I'll take care of your needs. But when you decide to lie and steal, you 
determined that God's word is not enough to sustain your life. God told you, I will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on me, but you decide to put your mind on everything else because you determined God's word is not enough to sustain your life. God told you, thou shalt not steal, yet you decided to steal and kill anyway because you determined that God's word was not enough to sustain your life. In church, you will lose in the battle of life when you decide to physically convey that God's word is not enough by your sin. Earlier this year, I was in Dallas preaching for a pastor friend at my mother's home church. She went to Sunday school earlier and she called me before she went into the sanctuary because she wanted to let me know what traffic was doing on the road. She called me and told me, she said, son, listen, they closed the exit ramp to I-45. You may want to find another route so you won't be late to the service. I'm just letting you know so that way you don't get caught in traffic and you get backed up and be late for the service. All right. An hour passes and I'm getting ready to get to the church. Thinking after an hour of time, traffic ought to be clear. The exit should be open. I'm looking at my GPS seeing that there's no problems on the road. So me and my feeble thinking said, thanks, Mom, but I'm good. Only to discover that when I got on the road, the same exit she told me was closed was still closed. And I had to be rerouted to another direction that delayed me from being on time and I was late for the service. And church, when you decide to follow your own way and disregard the word of God by saying it's not enough to sustain your life, you will be delayed and rerouted to what God has for you because you've already said his word ain't enough. And when we come to Advent season, we need to look at both the generosity of our Savior, but also our gruesome sin. Because the gospel must first be bad news to you before it's good news for you. There would be no babe in Bethlehem if there was no sin in your heart. Jesus came down from 40 and two generations, not because he didn't have anything better to do. He came down because he knew you had some gruesome sin in your heart and you needed a savior to pull you back and snatch you away from the gruesome snare of sin. That's right. Christmas time offers a view of gruesome sin. That's the bad news, but I can't leave you with bad news. Here's the good news of the text. Christmas time offers a view of God's sovereignty. I like verse number 15, Brother Piper, because God sees this combative war with Satan, and he declares ultimate victory in one phrase. He shall bruise your head. One time for the Father. He shall bruise your head. Yeah. One time for the Father, two times yeah. for the Son, three times for the Holy Ghost. He, he shall yeah. bruise your head. You do realize anything that is bruised at the head is bound to die. Yes. 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 God tells Satan, I see what you're doing in this combative war as you're trying to usurp my authority in the garden. But what I need you to understand, while you're trying to win this battle, you'll never win the war because the offspring that's coming will bruise your head. Now this church, in that one phrase, shows to us the sovereignty of God. We typically attribute the sovereignty of God to what God can do. We'll say God being sovereign means that God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants to, however he wants to. And while that is a good view of God's sovereignty, that's only a one-sided view. God being sovereign not only means he gets to do what he wants, God being sovereign also means that nobody can take his throne. Preach, Pastor. I'm trying to move back The sovereignty of God not only means that God has the right and privileges to do whatever he wants to, it also means that nobody can dethrone him from his seat in eternity. God is undefeated in 
and reigning in eternity. He reigns forever. But while he's undefeated, it does not mean he goes unchallenged. Look at the contest that takes place in the text. Here it is. The Bible says in verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 3 that the serpent was the most crafty beast in the field that the Lord has made. And Satan decides to use the serpent to be a vehicle to talk to Eve and deceive her from doing the will of God. And throughout his conversation, he tries to usurp God's authority and the authoritative word he placed in the garden. Every time he mentions what God said, here comes Satan. Did God really say that? Ah. Yeah. Yeah. That ain't what God meant. God don't know what he's talking about because in the day that you leave, he knows you're going to become like him. This is a microscopic view of Satan's intentions all along. Everything Satan does in the deception he renders and the lies he tells is a way to try to undermine the authority of God. Do you want to know why Satan got kicked out of heaven? Satan got kicked out of heaven because he said in Isaiah, I don't put my throne above God in the stars. <laughs> And throughout time, he's been trying his best to unseat yeah. God from his throne. Yeah. That's why you can't be friends with the devil because the devil doesn't care about you. He cares about the throne. Yeah. And the lies he tells you, the deception he puts in your ear, ain't necessarily to give you good tidings of glad joy. It's yeah. to pull you away from thinking that God ain't on the throne. Yeah. But even though He's made these feeble attempts. The text lets us know there's a conquest of this contest. Because in one phrase, God declares to Satan, you may try to win the battle, but you'll never win the war. Because the offspring of the woman will bruise your head. Now once again, y'all look at the language of the text to understand. He's talking to the serpent and says, I'm going to bruise your head. Yeah. Have you ever tried to kill a snake before? Yeah. You do realize that in order to kill a snake, you got to kill it at the head. Yes. You can't cut off the tail. I'm all rich. Because if you cut off the tail, the tail might grow back. Yes. You can't cut it at the stomach. Because after a while, the stomach will recover and it'll grow back. In order to kill a snake, you've got to kill it at the head. And God tells the serpent in the garden, you have no power or authority here because the seed of the woman will cut you off at the head. And when we view that phrase, it reminds us that God reigns forever. Because we know that offspring was that babe born in Bethlehem. And when we see that babe born in Bethlehem, it confirms God's promise made in the garden and it reminds us that God reigns forever. The birth of Christ is evidence that God reigns forever. The life of Christ is evidence that God reigns forever. The death of Jesus Christ is evidence that God reigns forever. And the resurrection and the ascension of Christ is evidence that God reigns forever. Y'all don't like me that way, let me come this way. God is not a politician that needs to campaign for re-election. He reigns forever. Not one who has to wait on Congress or city council to enact his power. He reigns forever. So it does not matter what Satan tries to do in time. God rules in eternity. He reigns forever. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate for bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Lord of all. Christmas time is a view of God's sovereignty. He reigns forever. It's a view of gruesome sin. It's a view of God's sovereignty, but it's also a view of the great sacrifice. Verse 15, God declares, I'm going to win and I'm going to reign forever because this offspring will bruise your head. But he also concedes that this victory comes with a sacrifice. Because he says, you will bruise his heel. All right. It's a reference to the suffering that the Christ child will endure in order to bring salvation to the world. Yeah. That he will have to make a sacrifice in order for this plan of salvation to come into play. God has already ensured the victory, right. but it comes with a sacrifice. Notice 
what Christ had to sacrifice in order to bring us salvation. First of all, it's a sacrifice of his deity. Because right. the text says, the woman's offspring shall bruise his head, but the offspring will suffer a bruised heel. Right. Once again, you've got to look at the text for what it does not say. God did not say that I'm going to bruise your head yeah. and you're going to bruise my heel. Nor did God say, my offspring will bruise your head yeah. and you'll bruise his heel. He says, the woman's offspring All right. will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It's a reference to the incarnate Christ. That when Jesus Christ came, he came as the incarnate, both fully God and fully man at the same time. And when you look at the genealogy of both Mary and the genealogy of Joseph, you'll discover that God had intentions all along to bring the Christ child to save us from our sin. He was both fully God and fully man at the same time, but God gave up his deity in order to become humanity so humanity could live with deity. He relinquished his divine rights in order to become one of us and redeem us from our biggest problem, sin. I'm amazed we caught up by the show Undercover Boss to show where these corporate bigwigs come down from their high story offices to dwell with their common workers, yeah. mingle with them and figure out what problems they need solved. Right. If you've been watching Undercover Boss, there was one episode where our mayor, Adrian Perkins, yeah. was at a rec center trying to figure out how to solve some of the problems in that rec center. The show Undercover Boss allows these CEOs to be undressed from their business attire. All right to wear workmen's clothes and dwell with fellow workers to address their biggest need. When Jesus Christ came from glory, he became our undercover boss. He took off his divinity, dressed himself in humanity, dwelt among us, so he can solve our greatest need. That's why the songwriter said, you came from heaven to earth to show us the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to make he be sacrificed yeah. his deity. But it's also a sacrifice by death. Yeah. It's also a sacrifice by death. The text says, your bruise is healed. All right. It's a reference to the suffering that Jesus Christ would have to endure. And when you look at this, especially throughout the time and out of Scripture, it reminds us of the fact that this Christ child right. came with some deadly intentions. Yeah, man. Oh, man. That this Christ child came because he was born to die. Yes, yeah. It says it here in Genesis chapter 3. When you look at what the prophet Isaiah says, Isaiah says that he came as a sheep before the slaughter. Yeah, all right. That he was cut off from the land of the living for my transgressions was he stricken. Even when you look at the gifts the wise men gave him at his birth, they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Yeah. Yeah. Myrrh in ancient culture was an embalming oil for the dead. Yeah. They would put murder on the dead in order to help relinquish the stench or the odor of oh. dead folks. Oh. It all points to the fact that he was born to die. Yeah. And when we come to Christmas time, yes, we ought to be glad that that baby was born in Bethlehem. Yeah. But it points to the fact that the coming of the Messiah was for salvific intentions. He came to die. In order to save us from our sin, he made the ultimate sacrifice yes. so that we could live and win in eternity. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. May the Lord God bless you real good. Yeah. 2017, yeah. Yeah. University of Arizona played Arizona State in a rivalry baseball game. Game was tied at three runs apiece. Top of the seventh. Arizona has two runners on base. All right. Alfonso Rivas comes to the plate. And instead of getting in his batting stance, he laid his bat across the plate 
to make a sacrifice blunt. He didn't swing at the plate. He just laid his back across the plate in order to make the sacrifice bunt. And as he hit the bunt, he was called out at first, but the runners were able to advance and score in order for Arizona to win the game. Come in. Come in. Because on the diamond of life, Jesus didn't use a bat. He used an old rugged cross. And he laid that cross out in order to bunt our sin away from us. And even though he was out at Calvary, it allowed us to advance so we could win the game. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And uh, by his stripes we are healed. Oh, Lord. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and he died to buy my pardon and an empty grave. Is there anybody here that's glad about that pain for in Bethlehem? Is there anybody here that's glad about that Messiah in a manger? Is there anybody here that's glad about that Savior born out of David's lineage? Is there anybody here that's glad about that Christ child? We thank God for your presence tonight as you viewed this sermon. We pray that it blesses you 
as you're in a reflective mode during this Advent season, that you think about the gruesome sin that has happened in your life. You think about God's sovereignty and you think about that great sacrifice that our Savior, that babe born in Bethlehem, was born to die. If you've been blessed by this lesson, blessed by this ministry, we invite you to give as God lays on your heart to do so. Here at St. Rest, you have several methods by which you can give. You can give physically. There is a drop box available on our campus. You can also give electronically through Givelify, PayPal, Zelle, Cash App, and Google Pay. Several methods of giving, but the same mentality. God loves a cheerful giver, and I'm a living witness. You cannot be God giving no matter how hard you try because the more you give the more god will give to you so if you feel led to give we invite you to do so and please know we'll be good stewards of how god blesses us through your contributions so come to a time of close several prayer requests demand our attention let's continue to keep sister mercy brown and her family lifted in prayer after the transition of her brother uh, we're praying that god continues to bless them and keep them during this time of grief and this time of bereavement we also want to pray for sister ruby larkins sister jackie smith and others who've been dealing with illness deacon caesar and his wife as well as others in our church family who have been dealing with illness and we want to pray with you if you feel led comment and let us know how we can walk with you in prayer we know God is able. We know God will hear us. And we know God will answer us according to his will. God, our Father, we bless you tonight for your word. We thank you for this privilege of prayer. God, you've heard the names mentioned. You know what's on the hearts and minds of your people. I pray, God, you bless those who have viewed tonight, that you will give them what they stand in need of. Bless them in the vulnerable spaces of their lives. Help them, have, help them to have faith to trust you. And hope to know that you will do what your word declares you will do. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you for what you are doing. And thank you in advance for what you will do. For it's in that name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.